Let's go. The friends with Adam Sandler effect. What you know. It's about who you know. And if you happen to befriend Adam Sandler between 1984 and 1994, you would likely have a multi-billion dollar box office resume. In this 10 year stretch, wow. Adam basically met everyone he would end up working closely with on films for the rest of his 30 year career. Wow. This group helped Sandler dominate Hollywood, whether they were writing, producing, directing, or sharing the screen with him. You could argue that Adam Sandler does not like making new friends. The only people added to the Sandlerverse in the 2000s were Nick Swardson and Kevin James. And yeah, Adam is definitely a good guy, helping his buddy stay employed all these years, but he also needs them more than you realize. Comedy and cinema fans have been debating on whether or not Adam Sandler is funny since the 80s. However, even he knew he wasn't that funny, which is why he carefully crafted an army of yes-men who were great at making Adam Sandler films, but wouldn't find much success without him. The real reason why Adam exploded into superstardom is actually more mysterious than you'd think. Today, Wow. Why they call him Yes Man? No, that was a little bit of shit. We are going to take a closer look into the Sandler squad who helped him build a Hollywood mediocre movie machine. That machine would lead to one of the most debated legacies of all time. Let's what go. Keeps you in the game. It seems oh, almost. Oh man, I I I was so crazy when I was young. I just thought like, yeah, I'm gonna be huge. I'm gonna be. I'm so psychotic. Delusion. The dream of becoming a Hollywood star is often shut down by the people around you. They will call you crazy. You're never gonna make it. They'd say. Adam was delusional, but that's exactly what you need to be to succeed. From the moment he decided wow. to be a comedian at age 17, he convinced as many people as he could to believe in his delusional dream. Adam arrived at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts in 1984, where he would be surrounded by thousands of other students pursuing artistic careers. His roommate- Okay, was they- was- was any of them, like, them is like all girls. Tim Herlihy would be the very first member of the Sandler Dream Team. Tim would go on to write Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore, The Wedding Singer, The Waterboy, Mr. Deeds, Bedtime Stories, Pixels, Ooh. Hubie Halloween, as well as working on multiple other Adam Sandler productions. Tim Big Daddy, Little Nicky, Grown Ups 2. He wrote all of them shits? Pay him! Tim has also made his fair share of on-screen cameos, like the fireman in Mr. Deeds, or the bouncing kangaroo in Big Daddy. I'm a singing kangaroo and I'm from far away. I like to hop, 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 fall, die. Every single creation that Tim has acted or produced in his entire career was for Sandler, which makes sense because he never intended on being in Hollywood. Tim Herlihy was actually an accountant, pursuing a law degree, and was never considered by his friends and family to be funny, but he was wow. enamored by Adam's charisma. Tim said he was extremely outgoing, his mouth going a mile a minute, and funny and all over the place. It was kind of a sight to behold. As a wow. fun hobby, Tim began writing jokes for Adam's stand-up comedy in their Britney Hall dorm room. Adam would practice his one-liners to strain in front of the coffee shop below his living quarters. As he got more confidence, he started hustling at comedy clubs, pips, and Catch a Rising Star. But Adam and Tim were not funny enough to consistently get laughs from the comedy club crowd, so they decided to recruit another member to the Sandler squad to help write more material. Adam became intrigued by a young man called Frank Karachi who lived down the hall. Adam said, at NYU he always frosted his hair. He had a mohawk. Girls loved him. He went to Dance Terry a lot. He went to a lot of cool clubs. He was the lord of the 80s. Frank aspired to write and direct films. He made short films in college and often had Adam star in them. He was the first person to direct Adam Sandler on a video production. Frank would go on to direct The Wedding Singer, The Water Boy, Click, Zookeeper, Here wow. Comes the Boom, Blended, and The Ridiculous Six. In Wow, nice. In fact, the only movies Frank Karate this is great. for the first 20 years were Sandler's projects. Frank recently stopped working with Sandler and just released his most critically acclaimed film of his entire career. Last week, Perhaps yeah. instead of goofy comedies, biographical documentaries were always his calling, and maybe working with Sandler was holding him back. Then again, if Sandler didn't consistently hire Frank to be his director, he might not have had a career to begin with. Plus, wow. Adam and the gang love to portray wacky side characters, and where would we be without Frank's portrayal of Bobby Boucher's dad, Roberto? Nowhere. Bobby Boucher. Bobby, it's me, your daddy, Roberto. 
Daddy? You know, I seen you on the ESPN when they was talking about you being drafted by the NFL. Adam's routine in what 1985 would be going to a comedy club on Monday, absolutely bomb, come back to the dorms and revise his material with Tim and Frank, and by Friday have figured out a way to make it better. His comedic persona was the everyman who makes relatable jokes enhanced with silly voices. I can talk about what dreams. You know, I'm a young. I, I, what dreams kind of ruined my whole life, you know? There's only so many times you can tell your mother you lost your underwear. Every NYC comic in the 80s knew to get recognized you had to perform at the comic strip. Comedy legends such as Larry David, Jerry Seinfeld, and Robin Williams were a few of the many that laid their comedic foundations here. Adam was able to land himself an audition and immediately impress the booking agent, Lucian Hold. He was only 19 years old and I signed him up immediately. He had all clean stuff, very quirky, very cute. I thought, this guy is really good. It's interesting that Lucian described Sandler with quirky and cute instead of funny. It's evident that Adam had star power, or it factor. And sometimes mm. it factor is unexplainable. You either have it or you don't. You will notice this becomes a trend in Adam's career. All of his friends talk about how they had a gut feeling about Adam. It wasn't necessarily that he was the funniest, they just knew he could be a star. But Adam thought he sucked. I don't nice. think I was, I'm not as sharp as some of the other guys that we grew up with. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and I wasn't as prepared when things went off. In I other words, you, what? You didn't memorize your stuff? I you didn't tried to, but it, I yeah. would choke. I would choke. I would oh. like. I would choke memorizing my jokes, and I would panic, and I would see stars and stuff, and I was gulping up. Sandler admits he wasn't the best at stand-up, but he knew it was necessary for him to learn if he wanted to have a career in comedy, film, and television. Wow. Luckily, he would meet a new funny friend, one who actually had interest in pursuing a comedy career. Alan Covert sat next to him in a history of comedy class at NYU where they bonded over their love for the film Caddyshack. Adam invited Alan back to the Britney Hall dorms and locked him in with clear from the very beginning that Alan was always going to play the support role for Adam, whether it was on stage or on the screen. He could created some extremely memorable characters like 10 Second Tom from 51st Dates, as well as the frowsy caddy in Happy Gilmore. Alright, give me a club. I'll get it. But Covert always felt like he had to prove himself. Because back then, I was still like fighting like, yeah yeah, yeah like yeah, they had yeah. to go like no 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 covert's funny like look i had to grow that beard just yeah, to be yeah, happy crazy mullet i was like no no no, it'll be good it'll be good i'm the guy i don't have to talk just let me be funny and look weird <laughs> and when Adam finally got his opportunity to be the main character in a sandler film he crushed it grandma's boy produced by happy madison productions was about a 35 year old stoner and video game tester who gets evicted and has to move in with his grandma and her two old lady roommates the irreverent comedy only secured six million dollars in the box office but was able to make over 30 million dollars in dvd sales. wow the numbers fuck. Seem small. so he got his opportunity and took off all but they six times their investment plus the sandler fandom loved this film just as much as other classics this seems like an obvious sign that covert had potential to be a strong lead but he only got one other lead role after this in the film strange wilderness after that he continued to take a backseat and play supporting roles like in Grown Ups 2 bedtime stories just go with it you could even argue his roles became less significant over the years but why maybe he didn't want to be a star maybe he just liked supporting his buddy or maybe there just wasn't enough room for Adam to shine while Alan was on screen. Considering he has producer credits on nearly every Sandler film he has acted in, maybe behind the scenes is where the team agreed he should be. Plus, he has a $12 million net worth, so whatever Adam says, eh? But Adam's grind no, and dedication real. to be great must not be understated. After securing his spot as a paid regular at the comic strip, he would still stand in the New York City subways performing covers of Beatles songs hoping to get tips from travelers. He got so confident with the guitar that he added it to his stand-up routine. In 1993, he signed a record deal with Warner Brothers. His debut comedy album, They're All Gonna Laugh At You, is actually two times platinum and was nominated for a Grammy. He even- What? They're all going to laugh at you two times platinum and nominated for a Grammy is crazy. He performed with a full band on his 1996 comedy tour and has done countless singing performances throughout his career, with the most notable one being a song dedicated to his late friend Chris Farley. You know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about my friend Chris Farley. 
It was also during oh, Aaron's wow. time at the comic strip that he met Chris Rock. Rock was fresh off his first Hollywood film and just getting established in the NYC comedy scene when Sandler arrived. Chris saw Adam's act and thought he was hilarious. And I'm watching him and he does this joke about uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain once scored 100 points in a game. And Sandler does this joke, he goes, uh, here's my impression of the coach of the other team. Who's got Wilt? But Chris didn't become a part of Adam's team, because he was a star in his own right, with way too much potential to help someone else. As they developed their acts together at the comic strip, they gained support from the club's owner, Richie Tinkin. Richie introduced Adam to a talent manager named Barry Moss, who in 1987 was casting for The Cosby Show. Keep in mind, The Cosby Show was the highest viewed sitcom on television for five years straight, averaging around 38 million views per episode. Adam auditioned and landed a small role as Smitty in just four episodes. From there, he secured a consistent spot telling jokes on remote control, which was MTV's very first original non-musical program. You know, I went to New York wow. all week and had a great time, real good time. I had one of these tour guides who really thought he knew everything, and but uh, he didn't know how to fly when I threw him off the Empire State Building. Ah! Remote Control also hosted college tours around the country where Adam was invited to perform stand-up. He was becoming somewhat of a micro-celebrity, occasionally being recognized on the streets of New York City. Adam's resume was getting strong. He had a little bit of money saved up and got a taste of Hollywood, so he decided to move to Los Angeles to get that much closer to making it on the big screen. And on the West Coast, there was another small crew of comedians who were about to join the Sandler hype train. Rob mm. Schneider was a few years older than Adam and had already been making noise in the comedy world. He just recently did a performance on David Letterman's Tonight Show, which was basically an early sign that you made it in the 80s. Schneider knew Adam was a buzzing comic, and even saw him and Chris Rock on the cover of a small comedy magazine called Comedy USA. So Rob was shocked one evening when he was performing a small LA show to see Adam Sandler take the stage. And I saw his first show out there, and I was the only two people really, really laughing hard was me and him. Really? He, he was laughing at himself, and I was laughing, and uh, I took him out for a beer afterwards and I said, oh man, you're going to be huge. Yet again, Adam <laughs> was not dominating the crowd, but for some reason, another comic was immediately convinced he would be a star. Rob took him out for a beer after his set, and from there, he became a part of the Sandler network. Rob helping Adam would not be a waste, as he would create some of the most memorable side characters in the Sandlerverse, such as Ula in Fifty First Dates, the Minister and I Now Pronounce You Chuck and Larry, and of course, the Townie and the Waterboy. You can do it! Cut his f***ing head off! I probably <laughs> Only I get much and they was tweaking in the water boy on the guys. However, critics didn't think Schneider was all that special. Schneider received a nomination at the Golden Raspberry Awards for the worst supporting actor for his role as the delivery guy in Adam's most successful 90s movie, Big Daddy. In your experience, was Sonny a good father to Julian? Oh, yes. The McTerrific pair. They went together like lamb and tuna fish. Lamb and tuna fish? Maybe you like spaghetti and meatball? Sandler was the winner of the Worst Actor Raspberry Award for this film, and would go on to win nine more Golden Raspberries throughout his career. He basically gets nominated for Worst Actor every time he releases a movie. When the critics started hating me, uh, I, I really, I, I just felt bad for my family. I felt bad for the people who worked hard on the movies, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, I had so many great actors in the movies, and when we would get done shooting it, they would say to me, I think the critics are going to like this one. And I'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> no, they're going to say bad oh. things. And they're probably going to say bad things about you being in it. But Big Daddy was oh, a $235 man. million dollar blockbuster hit. And Adam believed in Rob. And he was learning to ignore the critics. They immediately bounced back with Rob as the lead in Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, which earned around $92 million in right. the box office. But this the would be the plan. most profitable film with Rob as a lead. One by so just keep going. By one, every film with Rob as a lead would bring a smaller return on investment. The Animal, The Hot Chick, Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo, Benchwarmers, they kept the fandom satisfied, but none of them exploded in performance, leading Happy Madison, Adam's production company, to stop writing movies with Rob as the lead. Rob still believed in his capability of being a main character, but the two movies he released outside of Happy Madison's productions were utter failures, which Ooh. kind of proves that without Sandler's team, he couldn't be successful. So he went back to playing support roles which was fine until he wasn't invited to be in Grown Ups 2, Sandler's second most successful film to date. They're doing Grown Ups 2 without me. Mistake. They should have paid me a lot of money. Well, truthfully, I wasn't sure if I'd have my TV series, so it was an availability thing. But at the end of the day, they should have said, what money does Rob need? Rob?
Oh shit. Hold on. Said they were going doing grown ups too without me. Mistake. They should have paid me a lot of money. Too without me. Mistake. They should have paid me a lot of money. Well, truthfully, I wasn't sure if I'd have my TV series, so it was an availability thing. But at the end of the day, they should have said, What money does Rob What money does Rob need? Up need. Rob was given five lead roles by Sandler and dozens of support roles over the years. Despite critics relentlessly trashing his work, Sandler still gave him as much opportunity as he could. The moment Adam didn't bend over backwards for Schneider, he got angry and went to the media. This animosity led to Schneider not working with Sandler for years. They oh my god. Greed is a fucking sin. I've noticed that recently Rob Snyder hasn't made any appearances to Adam Phil for a while. I miss the wacky roles and the humor that Snyder brings to the table. He was even cut from the Grown Ups 2 for some reason. I've been trying to research and find a reason for this. Maybe an argument. Do you guys know anything about this? It would be such a shame if we've never seen Snyder in a Sandler film ever again. Oh my god. God. Eventually mended their relationship in 2015 because Rob understood without Happy Madison, he wasn't finding success. Luckily, Sandler doesn't hold grudges because he never forgot how many favors Rob did for him early on in his career. Everyone in this room tonight has made my life fun. People always would ask me, those bad reviews you get, how does that make you feel? Make you feel like shit? And I said, <laughs> No, nah, it really doesn't. I, I think the reason I, I get to say it, that didn't hurt me is because so many of you guys in this room made me feel great about what, what we've done together. And all my fellow comedians, actors, writers, collaborators, crew members, people on the streets, my family, my kids, my forever girl Jackie, all make me feel like the critics didn't know what they what the hell they were talking about. So thank you for all that. That's Schneider got Adam in at the Improv in the late 80s, which was the hot club for upcoming comedians in LA. At the Improv, Adam befriended comedian Judd Apatow. They even got an apartment together. Adam's, Adam's the next Eddie Murphy. You just knew it even when he was bombing. It wasn't like he was killing on stage and you thought that as a result of the success of his performances. Right. We found him hilarious. The crowds was hit and miss, but there was a certain charisma, which is the charisma which led to everything that happened that you felt when he was in his early 20s. If anything, hotter because he had so much energy as a friend to make you laugh because he wasn't making movies. So all that energy that he's put into his career in the early days was just used on you at dinner. <laughs> what you are starting to see is how valuable it is to keep people around you that believe in you. Adam has now developed a network of comics and writers who all uplifted him and knew he was hilarious despite crowds of comedy fans not seeing the magic. Ironically, Judd only worked with Sandler once in his career. He would go on to produce tons of movies that you probably think are way funnier than any of Sandler's films. Judd produced Anchorman, 40 Year Old Virgin, Knocked Up, Superbad, Step Brothers, Pineapple oh. Express, Bridesmaids, and many other comedy Classics. He wrote those maybe shits? Judd had a higher standard for comedy and didn't like Sandler's vision for films. Or maybe he was just focused on creating his own legacy. But while Sandler and Judd were living in that LA apartment together, Adam's buddy from NYU, Jack Giraputo, crashed on their couch for three months after realizing he hated law school. Jack would go on to form Happy Madison Productions with Sandler and produce every single film Adam has ever created up until 2015 when he finally retired. But the other leader of the Sandlerverse entered Adam's life during his time at the improv in the late 80s, David Spade. Spade was impressed with the same material that made Chris Rock a fan. So I'm gonna tell you one and what? you tell me if this is how it goes. Yeah. He's actually pretty funny. You said, uh, well, you go, um, Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points in one game, which is true. Right. And he goes, here's my impression of the uh, his team in, in the timeout in the huddle. Hey, Wilt, I'm <laughs> open, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I fleshly and prepared. And you go, here's the coach on the other team during the, the huddle. 
Who's covering Wilt? Uh, yeah. Uh, stay on him, I believe he's hot. That was, that's right. Yeah. I believe he's hot. I know, I used to get so excited to say that joke because it was one of the few that worked. It's interesting how a simple joke made some of the most promising comedians fully invested in Sandler. Aside from SNL, Dave's breakout role was alongside Chris Farley in the comedy classic Tommy Boy, which is actually rated higher than any of Sandler's comedy films. They released mm. another buddy comedy, Black Sheep, the following year. Spade bounced around from movies to TVs to animated films in the late 90s and didn't end up formally working with Adam until 2001, where he was casted as the lead role in Joe Dirt, another Joe Sandler Dirt. Cult classic. Throughout his career, Spade didn't want to ride the coattails of Adam. Around 2006, he started working with him more closely, taking support roles in Grandma's Boy, The Benchwarmers, and of course, Grown Ups, where the whole squad came together. But he has a wide resume of sitcom roles, the most notable being on Just Shoot Me and Rules of Engagement, both highly rated series. He also voiced various animated characters over the years, but the most popular was Cusco in Emperor's New Groove. Oh, wow. He also voiced the video. He was Cusco in Emperor's New Groove? I never knew that. Video game character Sparks, who was Spyro. Dragonfly friend. He even did various commercials and hosted award shows. Clearly, David Spade is the one man we all agree definitely would have been successful even if he wasn't Adam Sandler's friend. Swear. In fact, it's actually Adam who was lucky to be David Spade and Rob Schneider's friend, because they're the reason he got on Saturday Night Live in 1990. Comedian Dennis Miller was the anchor of SNL's Weekend Update segment. Weekend Update was their highest viewed program, and at the time, hosting it was an extremely coveted position in the comedy world. Miller scouted Spade and Schneider at the Improv and invited them to audition for SNL. They secured their spot as writers at the end of season 15 in 1990. Then Chris Rock and Chris Farley were added to the SNL team in season 16. With three of Sandler's comedy buddies advancing their careers in New York, Adam got a different opportunity, to be the star in his very first film, Going Overboard. Going Overboard was about a bartender on a cruise ship who dreams of becoming a comedian. The movie never hit theaters and is considered by many to be the least funny film ever made. Luckily, wow. his career would be saved when Schneider, Spade, and Rock convinced the SNL casting director to give Sandler a shot. He moved back to New York City and was added to the writing team in December of 1990. Sandler shared a tiny office with Chris Rock, Chris Farley, and David Spade. The crew felt like they finally made it, but Schneider was the one standing out. He was the first giant on our show. Oh, we had, it was been a good time. Yeah. Dennis Miller used to walk around going, okay. the Schneider man hit. <laughs> and he'd kind of throw it in all our faces. He was like, what are you guys got to come up with something? Yeah, <laughs> Schneider man, that's all I hear about. The guys would write jokes specifically designed for them, as they often relied on physical comedy. With Farley being the overweight maniac and Adam portraying goofy characters with silly accents, it didn't hit the same when anyone besides Sandler Farley or Spade delivered the jokes. Freshy Pepper. Why, yes! <laughs> Landing a job on SNL is basically the best comedy cosign you can receive in the industry, mm. so it becomes much easier to get business opportunities. Adam was landing movie roles left and right. He played Dink in the film Shakes the Clown, Carmine in Coneheads, then landed a primary role as Pip in Airheads. He met Steve Buscemi on the set of Airheads and would go on to cast Steve in over 10 films. Some of the fan favorite characters oh, yeah. were the homeless man in Big Daddy or Crazy Eyes in Mr. Deeds. Crazy Eyes! <laughs> Hey, hey, how you doing, pal? They always, they always, he always like some crazy ass dude in a movie or something. Just the way you like it. Oh, yes. French fries and Oreos. You know me all too well, dudes. What there the was fuck? one man that Adam Sandler used as a go to support role that ended up causing some major controversy. Peter Dante met Adam in 1992 while playing a game of one on one basketball at Gary Shandling's house. The two hit it off immediately. Peter would go on to have almost the exact same career path as Alan Covert, playing supporting roles and wacky side characters in various Happy Madison productions. He was the quarterback in The Waterboy. Watch where you're going, needle dick. The burnt out <laughs> friend in Mr. Deeds. He even got to co-star with Alan in Grandma's Boy. It seemed like Dante was a go-to side character for Sandler. What the fuck? He, he pretty funny too. 
all the way up until Grown Ups 2. During the filming of Grown Ups 2, Adam made Peter live within a mile of him so they could play basketball every day, which was often three times per day. But one major mistake would end their friendship forever. In 2013, oh. just after Grown Ups 2 released, Dante was checking into the JW Marriott Hotel in Santa Monica. According to the police report, the actor grew upset because he wanted a new room key and was not happy that staffers didn't recognize him as an actor. He then proceeded to call the black staff member the N-word as well as the F slur, as well as lashing out at a Mexican valet worker saying, do you know where you are? We don't need you. Someone from TMZ- Oh my god. You just fucked it up all the way, calling somebody the N-word and we don't need you here, Mexican, you fucking drunk bitch. Saw Dante strolling the streets days later and asked him about his belligerent antics. At least according to this guy. <laughs> my to you. He's gonna list all of his black friends for us. I know what you're doing is I'm gonna what? Ask my black ass Marcus can be about me. After doubling down on his racist remarks, he oh never worked in another Adam Sandler film ever again. For the oh. past 10 years, Dante has been living the high life, seemingly strung out on drugs and alcohol as the lead singer oh. of a failing reggae band performing dive bars in Southern California. Oh. His real life today is the exact persona depicted in his most popular film, Grandma's Boy. But oh Adam's comedic persona that he created on SNL in the 90s laid the foundation for his film career. Hey, uh, Canteen Boy, can I help you with something? Uh, not right now, Mr. McGrath. Just get myself situated. Oh, well, you know, I wouldn't want to rush you, Canteen Boy, because uh, you're one crazy, wild man. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Hello. Let me water your plants. <laughs> Please, while you're gone, let me water your plants. Go out, smiley boy. Hey, I'm Smiley Boy. Look at me. I got a big smile on my face. Now give me some candy. Turkey, turkey, D. Turkey, turkey, dap. I eat the turkey and I take a nap. Adam met Tim Meadows in 1993, who would go on to feature in a handful of Happy Madison productions. By 93 and 94, Adam was now a permanent on-screen talent on SNL and even recruited his first Sandler Squad member, Tim Herlihy, to write for the show. But some people, like Bill Murray, hated Adam's SNL material. Bill Murray was an SNL veteran, returning in 1993 to host, and wasn't very happy with the material he was seeing. Which Bill Murray are you gonna get? The nice Bill Murray? You're <laughs> <laughs> gonna get the tough Bill Murray. Yeah. You know? He's super nice to fans. He wasn't very nice to us. Interesting. He hated us on Saturday Night Live when he hosted. He did. Wow. Absolutely hated us. Seething. Saturday Night Live season 20, which was the last season wow. dominated by the Sandler crew, is up for debate as the worst season in the show's history. Because of the low ratings, NBC threatened to fire Lauren Michaels, who created and produced SNL since 1975. Sandler thought he was crushing it. I mean, him and his buddies thought the show was funny, but nobody else did, and it reflected in the viewership. SNL needed a fresh reset, so they fired Adam, Farley, Schneider, and Spade the following year. Yeah, I was fired. I was fired. NBC said that I was done. Then I made over four billion dollars at the box office. <laughs> so I guess you could say I won. Billy Madison released two months before Adam was fired from SNL. This was his first movie released through his own production company and secured a $16 million profit at the box office. Not only wow. that, but the film became a cult classic, a part of American comedy culture. Getting fired from SNL was the best thing to ever happen to Adam Sandler. It was now 1995, he had momentum after a banger film, and had a network of more than a dozen comedians, writers, and actors who believed in his vision. Like, was there a pivot point in your career where you just, you just knew, this is it, it's go time. Um, that's that's a good one, Nikki. Uh, I, I, Billy Madison. Billy Madison is when we started going. Come on, just all all my buddies. We all got together and we we're like, let's 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 do what we we think is funny. Yeah. And um and then we didn't stop doing it together and we made a bunch of movies together. Yeah. From there, his process was very simple. Here's how I think of my scripts. Sandler jokes. I sit in my room think up an idea, then I call up all my friends and they say, that's awesome, you're the best. Although he was kidding here, this isn't really far from the truth. 
Adam is a true testament of how valuable being a leader is. He is also the product of someone who had friends who deeply cared about him and believed in him when he had nothing. Instead of leaving those people in the dust, he designed his whole career around them, making sure that they were able to stay employed by creating formulaic comedy films with bizarre plots, stupid side characters, screaming, dad jokes, silly songs, then rinse and repeat for 30 years. And yeah, sure, critics hated basically all of his films, but he doesn't have to listen to your criticism because he doesn't operate in your standards of quality. He clearly is a much better actor when pursuing serious roles, such as Punch Drunk Love and Uncut Gems, yet he still doesn't care that critics are finally starting to praise his acting. He probably is only pursuing this next dramatic role in Spaceman because he knows comedy films are dead these days. Some people think Adam just surrounded himself with yes men, Aki comics who had nothing going for them so they latched onto their golden ticket in Hollywood. And I'm not gonna lie, his early stand-up and most of the stuff that was on SNL, I probably wouldn't have seen the Adam Sandler hype. But they clearly saw something in him that we didn't. And they were right. He made four Exactly, so that's that's all that fucking matters. Dollars making silly movies with his best friends and family while traveling around the world. That's what's Seems up, like he bro. He lived a perfect life. He did. Good shit, man. Good shit, fucking Adam Sandler. That was great. Go fuck this shit, man.